Hey everyone, we're back with another video in our post-operative complication series. And for this one, we're going to be talking about hypotension or circulatory shock. And what I think is going to be important about this video is we all learn this giant laundry list of problems and, and types of shock in medical school. Uh, but then when we're faced with shock in a clinical scenario, it can be incredibly overwhelming to feel like you have to go back and make sure you can remember every different type of shock and, oh, what if it's this one or this one or that one? Um, I think it can be really helpful to think about a specific clinical situation like a post-op patient. And when we have a patient like that in shock, to be really clear about what are the most common types of shock that we should be thinking about and allow us to have a nice, calm, methodical approach to this that can free up our mind to do that more complex diagnostic thinking uh, and also make sure that we're not spending uh, too many mental resources going down the rabbit hole of, oh my gosh, I have to rule out the zebra cause of shock, uh, which could detract you from the much more common and likely diagnosis. So to do that, I just wanted to do a brief review of the different types of shock. And maybe even before we do that, we should talk a little bit about what shock or hypotension is. And that's typically defined as a mean arterial pressure of less than 65 millimeters of mercury. So a map less than 65. Of course, a blood pressure is just a number and there are many physical findings and other uh, findings that we can measure that are related to shock, such as looking at urine output, which is indicative of renal dysfunction. Uh, if your patient has altered mental status, they might not be perfusing their cerebrum very well, um, et cetera. So with that in mind, let's talk briefly about our shock states. And this list is probably a little bit shorter than the types of shock you remember memorizing in medical school, but this is really about shock states and, and most types of shock will fall under one of these four states. Now I've put them in order of what are going to be most to least common in your post-operative patients. So here, when we're thinking about distributive shock, this is things like sepsis. Sepsis and sepsis. Sepsis is very common, very common post-op. So that's why I want to first come to your mind when you're thinking about shock in the post-op patient. Other types of distribu distributive shock that are more rare are things like anaphylaxis, mm -hmm. um, which would usually be re related to a, medication, a new medication given in the perioperative period, or something like neurogenic shock, uh, but that is very rare post-op, uh, much more common in our trauma population, and should be pretty obvious if your patient is paralyzed or not. So really distributive, I want you to mostly think about sepsis. Hypovolemia, this just means having too little fluids uh, in your bloodstream. Sorry, I should go back even. So distributive shock, sepsis, what does that mean? Right, so let's say this is a blood vessel, right? If it's its normal size, it has its normal amount of fluid in it, everything's fine, the blood pressure is normal. But in some sort of setting of extremely profound inflammation, now that vessel dilates, it becomes leaky, right? There's holes in your capillaries, so fluid's leaking out and the space is bigger. And now you have that same amount of fluid, but it's not enough uh, to take up the space. So that is a distributive pro problem because uh, the fluid is too little to distribute to this entire new uh, potential space that's been opened up by this inflammation. And then hypovolemic shock is when blood vessel space are normal, but for some reason there's just not enough fluid in here. You're in the post-op patient, this is usually uh, just a lack of fluids given in the operating room, surgery and, and open abdomens. Uh, cause a lot of insensible losses, so people need a lot of fluid replacement. And of course, the other major cause would be if you have a hole in a blood vessel somewhere and you're just bleeding out either usually into the abdomen or, or some sort of potential space in the body. Um, and then your other types of shock are going to be much less common in the post-op patient. So cardiogenic shock, that just means uh, the blood vessels are normal or usually just clamped down even but your heart is not able to function well enough to push blood through the circulation. This could be because their heart muscle is just not working well enough, some sort of acute, usually acute on chronic heart failure. It could be some valvular disease. It could be a post-op arrhythmia. Uh, that's overwhelming the ability of your heart to provide cardiac output. And then finally, obstructive. This is These are really rare types of shock, but in my experience, these are types of shock that people spend in an ordinate amount of time kind of really... Uh, freaking out about in the initial setting when it's actually quite rare and that they probably would be better off thinking about some of these other ones. Uh, 
But some examples of this would be things like pulmonary embolus, um, pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade. And so, of course, important causes, and certainly if you see somebody who's incredibly hypoxic along with their hypotension, you might be thinking about PE or if they have the bulging neck veins or no breath sounds on one side, like pneumothorax, stuff like that. So obviously we don't want to not think about them, but if, if one of these is not really calling out to you from the clinical picture, I wouldn't spend a ton of time thinking about obstructive shock. And, and why do I say that? So here are some data from a couple of New England Journal articles. There's a 2013 article in the New England Journal on circulatory shock that cites a previous article in 2010, uh, a big RCT of um, different types of pressor treatments for shock. But the point is they looked at these 1600 patients and keep in mind, these are not surgical patients. These were even medical patients and asked what are the most common types of shock for people admitted to an ICU. And we see that distributive shock is by far and away the most common. It's over half of cases. It's over 40% uh, absolute percentage points higher than the next most common cause of shock, which is hypovolemic. Now I'm saying hypovolemic rather than cardiogenic, even though these two are technically tied, because I remind you that these are all um, all comers as opposed to just surgical patients. So in surgical patients, you're going to have less of this cardiogenic shock and probably a lot more of the hypovolemic shock. So that's just why I'm, I'm emphasizing really the distributive. Remember, thinking about sepsis, anaphylaxis, and the hypovolemic, thinking about under-resuscitation with fluids, and thinking about uh, bleeding uh, that are really going to be important in our post-op patients. Cardiogenic, of course, is still possible, but once again, it's a relatively low percentage. And obstructive is just extremely rare. 2% of all patients, probably an even lower percentage of surgical patients. So, of course, something to still keep in mind, but really... Uh, I want us to be focused on the distributed and hypovolemic causes of shock in our post-op patients. All right, so here's our example page. Patients got a low blood pressure. We'll assume that they took this correctly and rechecked it. Um, and it's still low. They're asking you to please assess this patient. And so if we're thinking again, remembering our hypoxia videos, there's some things where we have to act, where we have to prescribe treatments with incomplete data. And this is certainly one of them. You can't just leave a patient hypotensive uh, until you have a diagnosis. So we, we see, once again, we've got this outer algorithm where we have to deal with the symptoms with an initial treatment uh, without a diagnosis. While we're doing that treatment, we can work on our workup, thinking about moving our patients to a different level of care. And then only then can we really give a ton of thought to getting really granular about our differential and our diagnosis. So our kind of uh, initial or stabilizing treatments uh, for shock, once again, a low mean arterial pressure, usually less than 65. The first treatment, especially again in post-op patients, is going to be fluids, fluids, fluids. In most patients, these are going to be some sort of isotonic fluid. Um, for example, lactated ringers or normal saline. Uh, if your patient is highly likely to be bleeding, maybe they're a trauma patient that's been bleeding, or uh, you have a patient with a drain and you see blood in the drain, then that fluid is going to be blood products, right? Packed red blood cells, plasma, et cetera, thinking about a balanced blood resuscitation. But either way, the first thing you should be trying when your patient is hypotensive is some sort of fluid bolus. Uh, even if your patient has a cardiac history, uh, if patients with a low EF or... Um, or cardiac function, they still need fluids if they lack fluids, right? Like a pump, even a bad pump needs fluid to, to be able to pump that fluid forward. So don't be afraid to try a fluid bolus in a patient that may have a history of heart failure, especially if they're acutely hypotensive and we're thinking about them being a post-op patient where they're highly likely to have some sort of distributive or um, hypovolemic or hemorrhagic shock. Just certainly be a little bit more judicious. Maybe if they're not responding, you don't just keep slamming them type thing, but certainly Fluids, fluids, fluids is the first thing you should be thinking about. And of course, to administer these fluids, you're going to need good IV access. Um, that's going to go into our next treatments as well. So a, a patient with hypotension, uh, usually I'm getting that page, I'm calling them back and saying, how's our IVs? Uh, maybe if we don't have good access, we're calling for some sort of assistance SOS team to help us get good IV access, but that's going to be crucial uh, to our treatment of this patient. And then uh, next line, hey, sorry dog scratching. Uh, so this next line, 
of treatment. If you're giving fluids, it's not enough, not working. We want to think about vasopressors. Um, we could have a whole talk on just pressors, but the short answer is norepinephrine. It's almost never wrong to give norepinephrine as your first line presser. Uh, there are some situations where other pressors are better, but norepinephrine is rarely wrong, right? There might be something more optimal, but if you start with norepi, then when you have a little bit more time, a little bit more stabilization, you can really get into the weeds and figure out if there might be a better choice. But if you're you know, new to hypotension, new to treating this patient, and uh, you're in a really stressful situation, just choose norepinephrine. Don't think about it anymore. Let your mind deal with the, the rest of this usually chaotic situation. And then another thing to think about is ventilation. So when patients are critically sick, for a variety of reasons, they'll usually become hypoxic to some degree. You want to be supporting that and have a low threshold uh, to potentially intubate a patient that's doing really poorly. And then finally, down here, I have other. And this just means that, of course, these are not the only things you're doing, especially in some of those special cases where you're highly suspicious of uh, maybe some sort of obstructive shock, uh, if your patient's maybe having terrible chest pain, you think they're having a heart attack, right? Like obviously the situation might call for something else, but in general, undifferentiated hypotension, you want to be thinking about fluids, you want to be thinking about pressors, uh, and you want to be thinking about ventilation. All right, and then the workup is next. And this is really kind of the kitchen sink approach, right? Hypotension is no joke. We want to get right on top of it and you need these things kind of cooking so you can make decisions fast because this patient's in a very acute situation. Ideally, your patient is awake and alert and you can talk to them. Um, but if they're not, you can still at least do a physical exam. You can talk to the, the nurse and the other caregivers of the patient that I've seen them recently get a good sense of the scenario that will usually uh, give you some serious clues about what sort of shock this might be. Of course, vital signs as well go along with that. And then when we're talking about labs, just the kitchen sink, CBC, basic metabolic panel. Um, this is looking for infection or bleeding. The basic metabolic panel uh, will look at things like kidney function, any bad electrolyte derangements. Lactate's a big one in shock. Uh, an elevated lactate is not a great sign. And then an arterial or venous blood gas will give us information about their pH as well as their uh, PCO2. Thinking again about our common causes with septic shock being so common, usually you want to be thinking about some sort of infectious workup. Uh, the basic kind of most rudimentary infectious workup is two blood cultures, a urinalysis, and a chest x-ray. Uh, I put imaging down here. You're usually going to be getting some sort of imaging depending on your suspicion. If you have blood coming out of a drain, maybe you're getting a CTA of the abdomen. If you just think they're infected somewhere, you're not sure. Maybe it's a leak in the belly. You might be getting a CT abdomen pelvis or chest abdomen pelvis. Uh, really, there's no one type of imaging, um, but just be thinking about how that might be needed in your diagnosis based on the scenario in front of you. And then finally, we have this other category again. Once again, the guys, if someone's having horrible chest pain, grabbing their chest, you think they're having a heart attack or their heart rate's 160 and irregular, you want to be analyzing that further with something like an EKG. If you thought they had tamponade for whatever reason, there's things like focused cardiac ultrasounds, et cetera. I mean, the, the causes of shock, like I said at the beginning, are broad and varied. Uh, but at the very least, I know in any patient with hypotension, I'm going to be throwing these common things at them. And then I, because I know that this is what I want every time, I can give some, some real deep thought to the other imaging or studies that might be needed as long as I follow this basic approach. Finally, we talked about this in our last video. Always remember your spectrum of level of care from lowest up to highest in the ICU. Most patients with severe hypotension are going to end up uh, in the ICU, uh, especially if they need pressors. They almost always need to be in this sort of highly monitored setting. And then once we've done all this, we can step back a little bit and think a little bit more deeply about the differential. Uh, you should be getting your labs back, but I want you to remember this whole time, uh, remember that common things are common, be thinking about sepsis, be thinking about bleeding, um, and don't let something super rare, like some of these obstructive causes of shock, really draw you away from um, considering how your patient may be septic or bleeding if they're post-operative. The way I like to think about it is, you know, is it more likely for the patient's body to have randomly kind of broken, like their heart just gave out on them randomly, or, or some sort of their normal homeostasis just happened to give out after surgery, or something external, like an organism, bacteria, 
or some sort of technical issue or bleeding related to their surgery caused the problem. Those are, like we've said, much more common, even in all comers uh, as causes of shock, but especially in the post-op patient, um, it can help keep you a little bit centered and keep your thinking more clear if you're, if you're really focused on these distributed and hypovolemic causes of shock. All right, uh, that's it for this video. This is for educational purposes only. Do not use this to diagnose or treat any diseases, and we'll see you next time.